Welcome to the Homeschool Mama Self-Care Podcast. I'm Teresa Wiedrich from CapturingTheCharmLife.com. If you are a homeschool mama challenged by doubt, not sure you can do this homeschool thing. If you're a homeschool mama challenged by overwhelm, there are just too many things to do. Or if you are a homeschool mama unsure that the way you're showing up in your homeschool isn't the way you want to be showing up in your homeschool, then this is the podcast for you. I'm here to encourage you in your homeschool journey to help you strategize ways to turn your homeschool challenges into your homeschool charms. So welcome, homeschool mama. Today, I get to introduce you to Allison Morrow. Allison is from goodschooling.com. She's a former classroom educator who has homeschooled her own children, who are now 14 and 16. She's done that since the beginning. And since 2016, she's helped hundreds of families launch their own homeschool adventures. Or for those homeschool families that have been doing it for a while, she helps them find clarity and confidence in their journeys through a less is more homeschool mindset. Allison lives in Texas with her husband and daughters, but helps families all over the world through goodschooling.net. So welcome, Allison. It's such a pleasure to have you back. And I'm so oh, glad that you. we can chat and explore some things that I think uh, homeschool families across North America have been learning and gaining from you. So thank you for being here. Oh, I'm glad to be back. <laughs> I really enjoyed list, or, uh, looking at your your website because you shared your story, the two years of miserable, expensive, exhausting trial and error that ensued, sounds like my experience, (laughs) showed you that being a teacher and being a homeschooler are two very different things. Yep. So as an introduction to the community, the podcast community, would you share a little bit about you, your homeschool story and your homeschool family? Yeah, absolutely. So Um, I was blessed to know a homeschooling family when I was growing up. And so by the time I got into adulthood, I'd kind of already decided that homeschooling looked like a pretty good, it was a good option. I wasn't necessarily sure I was going to do it, but at least I was aware of it. I knew it was a thing. I went into education myself. My minor or my major was education, um, elementary education. And when I started doing my student teaching, when like, I mean, and I vividly remember it was the very first day of my student takeover. So like the classroom was mine for two weeks. I was, you know, buck stops with me. I can still picture standing in front of all those kids. And I realized after being in that classroom for two months already, this system is so broken. I'm like, I love teaching, but I am never putting my own children in these seats. So I knew before, you know, graduation from college that whenever I had kids, we were going to be homeschooling them. And you know, fast forward to having kids. And, um, you know, I was in those, those early, like the preschool years with my first and was very, um, you know, I'm a research fanatic. I love to learn. I love to research. And so that, of course, I'm like preschool, we have to start learning how to read. So I'm (laughs) like, you know, I'm looking at all the things and I'm getting all the stuff. And gratefully that mom that I knew who had homeschooled back in the day, uh, when I was a kid, she had told me, Hey, just wait a little bit, just wait a little bit. And I think even for as rocky and crazy as our, our start to homeschooling was without that, it would have been a million times worse. So thankfully I kind of took my foot off the gas for a couple of years, but then we got to that, like my daughter, my, uh, my oldest was six going on seven. So kind of like first grade year. And I was like, it's time to bring in the curriculum. So, and I'm like curriculum, like it's totally no big deal. I've been a teacher. I know how this works. If I can teach a classroom at 30, I can certainly teach one, you know? (laughs) And so we launched what was really very much school at home and, um, things got, (laughs) other things were going on in our lives that actually caused my husband to have to be the one to do the homeschooling. And of course he was like, this was your deal. I have no idea what I'm doing, you know? So I'm teaching him, oh, this is how curriculum works. This is how you teach. And that lasted for two years and we came out the other side of it and went, that was absolutely miserable. We spent, we're still married. We're still married. Yes. 19 (laughs) years this summer. Yes. we survived. (laughs) But we got to the end of that and realized we had spent probably close to a thousand dollars on curriculum over those two years. The vast majority of which was still sitting on the shelf. Some of it had literally, we opened the box and went, Nope. And closed it up and put it away. 
And, and we realized that so much of what we'd done over those two years was based on the assumption that school at home is homeschooling, which we, after those two years, realized is not true. And realized that so much of what homeschooling families do when they start their homeschool adventure, their homeschool journey, is that they just trial and error the whole thing. They, you know, they say, well, this looks good and this looks good. Yeah, let's give it a go and see what happens. And after a few months of that, constantly trying new things, going, oh, this doesn't work. Wait, this is burning me out. Wait, this is way too much. This isn't enough. Does it, my kid doesn't learn this way, blah, blah, blah. It, you come out the other side of it going, is this really worth all this work and stress and money and time and frustration like, where's the payoff? Like, what, what, how is my kid going to learn if we're constantly changing curriculum and we're constantly changing what we're doing and we're, you know, and so that was what started us on this path of like trying to figure out what would be a structured step-by-step approach to figuring out how you best homeschool so that when you start, you actually know what you're doing. You're not trial and erroring everything. You're not, you know, just going based off of, you know, what your neighbor uses or what your pastor's wife uses or what your cousin uses or what that blogger on the internet uses, but you're figuring out who am I as a homeschooler? What's my personality? What's my child's personality? How do they best learn? What Uh methodology do we want to use? So you're starting off with way less stress, way less craziness. So that was the launch. That was kind of what started good schooling and, you know, kind of our whole, what we do now with, with homeschool coaching. And I have two, so I have two girls, I've got a 16 year old and an almost 14 year old. And, um, they've been homeschooled pretty much from the beginning. We, you know, we've done a couple of years in a hybrid program here and there, but vast majority of what they've done has just been straight at home. So tell me then you said that you saw that the system was broken inside the school. And you also saw that the school at home approach in your home wasn't working. Were there similarities, commonalities? What would you, what was your experience with both of those? You know, when we were doing the school at home thing, we were very focused on um, output. What is the stuff our children are doing that we can look at and say, look, it's evidence that they're learning. Very focused on the worksheets and the tests and the quizzes and what have you memorized and what can you spew back to me? which is really, I mean, that's, that's how the public school functions. Cause it's the only way you can function when you're trying to teach that many kids mm-hmm. all at yeah. once, you can't individualize it. You can't meet one-on-one with each child and figure out how are you doing? Are you really getting this? You know, it's all focused on that external output. And can you prove, can you show me a paper with a hundred percent marked at the top that says, yes, you, you know what you're doing. And that I think is one of the it's, it's one of the most, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's one of the biggest myths I think of homeschooling is that you should be able to point to a piece of paper and say, look, this is evidence that my child is learning. So that's the commonality then is that you look for the output or you did look for the output in a school system and you did look for the output in your homeschool mm -hmm. and neither of those was the point. Exactly. Yeah. We, we came to realize early on, man, our kids know a lot more than these little pieces of paper are saying. Right. And how important really is all of this stuff on the paper? Is that right. really education exactly. being able to, you know, yeah. to fill in the right word, the right thing, the right, is that, is that true learning? And is it really serving them specifically? Because I'll go back to what you said. You were saying, instead of doing this trial and error thing, which I want to hear, like, how do you buck the trial and error thing? But instead of doing the whole trial and error with every single methodology methodology out there or mythology, (laughs) you can try them all, which I have, most of them, and taking little bits of all of them, and then called myself eclectic with every other homeschool mom out there after 15 (laughs) years, um, most of them, Uh, then you can actually decide quickly how you want to engage your children. How do you do that? Where do you go when you start, you know, engaging a homeschool family with their new homeschool kids? So the the first thing I focus on is what is your philosophy of of education? And most, you ask a parent that, and they have no idea. And they're like, no, I don't do philosophy. Like that's who that's way too much, you know? And I'm like, it's not a big fancy thing. It's just like, literally, what do you think is education? What is the point? What is your goal? When your child leaves the nest and goes out into the world, 
What do you want them to know? That is your philosophy. And you just need to like reverse engineer it back to today. How are we going to get there? Right. And for so many families, I think they just start out assuming, well, we have to get a bunch of books and we have to sit and do those books and get through those. And if we get through this curriculum, magically, that culminates in my child having an education. Right. And so um, when I can get parents to really think about, okay, what are your goals? What do you think is really important? And then ask, okay, so how are you going to get there? Like, what do you want your days to look like? What would your child be willing and able and what are they wired to do that is going to get them there? I have a child who is ADD and dyslexic and highly kinesthetic. This child loves to move. She has boundless energy. Um, She loves to use her hands. If I sit her down with workbooks for four (laughs) hours a day, She's going to lose her ever loving mind. And we've tried that and it's happened. (laughs) Exactly. You know, because you've tried it. (laughs) So that's the next thing you got to look at is what makes sense for your child. This is what you want. This is what you want for them, which is great. Now you got to look at your kid and ask yourself, is what I want for them realistic? Is what I want for them in their best interest? So I think, you know, for so many of us, we get so caught up in this, um, comparison thing and this fear of being judged and people are going to think I'm not doing enough for my kid and I'm not giving them the right education. We've got to stop looking at what everybody else is thinking and look at our child and say, what does this human being right here need? Okay. I got to stop you. And I just want to say that everyone that already listens to this podcast knows you are just saying what I always say. <laughs> so, amen, girlfriend. Yes. Look at Reaching to the choir. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It is my heart. And it mm-hmm. took me a long time to understand that because I definitely brought home my kids to do a private school at home with Susan Weisbauer's book, A Well-Trained Mind. Uh-huh. And my six and eight year old do remember me doing hours of read alouds, either history or science or an evening read aloud or a morning read aloud. And we would do narration and they'd have to write for two pages like, hello. (laughs) My question to homeschool parents is, and I wish I could have asked myself then, is it working for you? Yeah, it wasn't working for me. It required me to do a lot of forcing, which is not working for relationships. And I mean, just because you put stuff in to their, you know, their hands and say, you must write this, or you must sit here for this period of time. It does not mean they're learning. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And you're, you're, like you said, it's wrecking your relationship. Yeah. It's destroying their, their natural love of learning. And I think that's the thing that we, because of the system we have, society has been so brainwashed to believe that people aren't going to learn unless they're forced. Children right. aren't going to learn unless they're forced. And the reason they think that is because we put them into the system so early that we absolutely crush their natural love of learning. And then we take them out and we say, oh, well, look, they don't want to learn. All they want to do is play video games. All they want to do is, you know, go play, you know, baseball and, and, and play with their friends. They don't want to sit and learn. It's like, well, you can't completely crush their love of learning and then say, oh, look, they don't want to learn. You yeah. caused that. Yeah. It's because of what you've been making them do. If we don't put them into that system in the first place, they will learn because that's what human beings are created to do. We're created to learn. Right. And so it's yeah. just, if you avoid that system and you avoid putting into your child's life, the things that are going to distract from that screen time. Um, and I, and, and I, I say that while my children both have iPads and computers and phones, yes, yes, so I mean, we do screen time, you know, but He's practicing his chest stuff. And I have issues with the always being on screens myself for a, like a brain related issue, which I think is valid. This is my opinion. And at the same time, he's learning to be a grandmaster chess person, whatever they call. And I'm like, but still it's a screen. <laughs> like, <laughs> <you know. laughs> yeah. Well, so, yeah. So, you know, I, I think that, um, Parents then, when they try to homeschool, they have this myth in their brain that my child isn't going to learn unless I'm cramming this stuff into them. And so the more time they spend doing that, the more they get this feedback of, oh, my child hates to learn. No, your child hates having information crammed into them, just like you would, you know, (laughs) oh, my child, you know, my child doesn't like school. Well, would you like this either? I mean, you know, I, but they don't know what else to do. And right. that's the problem is that so many parents come into homeschooling, having no idea what other, you know, first of all, just how human, how human development works 
how the human brain is wired to learn yeah. without knowing that there are lots of different approaches to education and to learning lots of different ways you can approach this. All they know is this one system. And so they bring it home. They go, oh, we're going to customize it by like doing homeschool in our pajamas. And by, you know, you get to do it in fancy, you know, pink gel pens instead of a pencil. And that's <laughs> not the same as customization. That's just, you know, making it a, a, an unbearable thing, slightly more bearable, you know. So tell me how you learned this. How did you get to this place of synthesizing this? If you started in the similar place that I did, where you're like, I will at home and then it wasn't working for you or how did you learn? Um, So I actually, it's funny, Susan Wise Bauer's book on classical education was the first book I ever read that was not about just general education, like education, the way that like public school education is. Right. And so that was my first like, oh. There's a thing, there's a whole other type of learning called classical right. education. And so then I started um, learning a little bit more about that. Yep. And along those, that line, I heard about Charlotte Mason because I'd yep. see people who are doing a mix. They're doing, you know, Charlotte Mason and classical because there's some overlap there. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, Charlotte Mason, what on earth is that? And so then, and so I, I kept finding these little, you know, people had mentioned that and then, oh, there's some Charlotte Mason people who also do Waldorf. (laughs) So it was just this kind of like breadcrumbs that I started chasing and started realize, my gosh, there's all these different ways to homeschool. Who knew? Like I had no idea. And I actually created at one point a, a graph of all of these different homeschooling approaches that I had discovered to try to kind of help myself see at a glance, like, if I was this type of person, which one of these systems would I want to use? If I was someone who wanted to be really structured um, and I wanted to use a lot of curriculum, which one of these would fit best? If I was really, you know, I wanted to be a little more free form, I wanted to follow my child's interest, uh, but I wanted a little bit more structure, which one of these approaches would, would best fit that? And that was when I started thinking about the fact that, hey, we are the boss of our own homeschool. We get to decide which method do we want to use how do we want to use it? How do we want to, um, you know, combine it with other things? And so that was kind of that next shift that I had in this idea of helping families lay a solid foundation, thinking through all of this stuff from the beginning, instead uh-huh. of figuring it out along the way and having to constantly change things up. So that was kind of how, how all of that happened was just this, you know, this research of my own, just kind of chasing it and discovering this whole new world of all of these different approaches to education that I had no idea existed. Right. I found that I was just very unhappy because I I really was, it was like a January, February of the third or fourth year in, and my oldest is an Enneagram type eight. And she's just so strong from the get go. And she was like, I don't want to do it. Like she might not have said it that way, but it was a constant resistance. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, me yelling and me going, we have to do this. It's so important. And, and, you know, and she was one of four. Mm. Well, you know, she, she had her unique way of doing it, but I, I could just see this is not working. It does not make me happy. It is not making my child happy. And then I happened to come across John Holt in a Mm. library and that was it. Now (laughs) the heavens opened up and the angels sang. (laughs) It was prophetic or something. And I read his stuff because he's a school teacher. He's like a 30 year veteran home or a school teacher, actually, uh, that discovered that I don't think kids are learning and And then over the course of maybe a couple of weeks, I finally sat down my child or my oldest in a Starbucks and said, we will never homeschool again. And that lasted for six months, by the way. (laughs) 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 And then I went back to all sorts of different things. But getting from this place, like as homeschool people or parents, we have our own experiences with education. We all have different either post-secondary or just like our high school educations, or we have certifications or we have all sorts of things. And that informs how we approach our child. Mm -hmm. And also our specific child is not known to us right off the top. We get to know them gradually. And a combination of like you said, exploring the methodologies and hearing people talk about different things factoring in our own thoughts about what we think an education should be, our values, who the actual child is in front of us, all of that forms a specific approach in homeschool, which makes us extremely eclectic, all of us. Yeah, yeah, 
And I think that the other big key that's really missing is the fact that once you learn about all of this stuff, so once you learn, oh, there's this thing like Charlotte Mason or this Montessori or, you know, whatever, is the fact that just knowing that exists does not necessarily mean your brain is going to be able to grab onto it and really follow that methodology because you still have all this other crap from public school and that whole system in your head. And there needs to be a process of weeding all of that out and detoxing. And it's that de-fueling process. Fueling or detoxing. Yeah. Yes. That so many parents miss because they just don't know it's a thing. I didn't know it was a thing. Even I had done all of that work, learning all of this stuff. I even started coaching parents before I knew what de-schooling was. Then I learned what it was. I figured I made this connection finally and started thinking, gosh, I need to de-school myself. I have only, I mean, I've been coaching for six years now. I've only been de-schooling myself for like three and a half of them. And I feel like I still have such a far way to go, but it has helped so much in my coaching and with my own children. Yeah. And now it's like the thing that I yell about to everybody the most, you've got to de-school, you've got to de-school, you've got to, it is so incredibly important because without that, you're not going to be able to fully unlock your true homeschool potential and truly set yourself up for long-term success because you're constantly going to be running up against these frustrations, these obstacles, these comparisons, these assumptions, these myths yes. that you haven't taken the time to root out. And it's just going to keep poisoning the well. So what's the process then? How would you suggest we can understand the de-school process and actually do it? I think one of the one of the first ways, I think, is to start looking into other methodologies just exposing yourself and seeing that these things exist. That's, that's like the first step. I think the next step after that is reading people like John Holt, um, like John Taylor Gatto, um, reading unschoolers like, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the book. It might just be called unschooling maybe. Um, because unschooling is like, I don't want to say it's like the purest form of education because I do think it has some flaws, but it is definitely the furthest away on the spectrum from conventional school. Yeah, and it so is. <laughs> reading about how families doing do that and what their children have gone on to do, and I think that's the key, seeing that these people, they really can like have a normal life when they go off into the world and get jobs and go to college and, you know, that they're not just bumming around on, you know, they're in their parents' basement doing nothing. They actually got an education this way, seeing that it's successful, you know, Um, exposing yourself to that, seeing how these families operate, see how children actually learn, and then look, learning about particularly at the younger years, early childhood development and how they are wired to learn. Um, Peter Gray, he's another fantastic one. Psychologist, Peter Gray, he writes, that's his thing is, is education and how children learn. He's a huge proponent, proponent of unschooling yes. um, because of what he's, he's researched and what he has learned about how children learn. And he's like, this is learning. This is how we were really made to. And if you look at, you know, education in the thousands of years leading up to the last couple hundred years, you'll see that's how everybody learned. The vast right. majority of people, they learn through life. That's just what you did, you know? This, what we have now is the experiment. Homeschooling is not the experiment. Public school is the experiment, right? Interesting thought, yes. Yeah, and so um, so I think just exposing yourself to those things, reading those different approaches, and then really taking the time to ask yourself, what do I think education is supposed to look like and why? Why do I think my child has to learn algebra? Why is it so important to me that they do that? And what is algebra? (laughs) What is it? And why is it important? Is it really? Does my, does every child need to know algebra? Does my particular child need to know algebra? This child who, you know, I can guarantee you is never going to be a STEM kid. It's not her thing. Most likely not going to college. I'm a hundred percent okay with that. Why does she need to know that? What does she really need to know? She really needs to know how to balance a checkbook. She needs to know how to have a budget. She needs to know how to make change. She needs to know, you know, accounting for a business because she's very entrepreneurial that I can see her doing. And if she needs to learn the algebra, she can figure that out because, you know, that was me. I did, um, a, you know, typical high school program and then didn't finish what was expected a, a high school, like, um, 
and university level science or math. And so I didn't do either of those before I went into my nursing program, but Mm -hmm. I had an interview with one of the staff there, the registrar staff. And she said, well, listen, you can decide to take either chemistry, like grade 12 chemistry, or you can take grade 12 math alongside your program. Do you want to do that? I said, okay, scared spitless. But <laughs> you know, like this is like a number of years after I'd even taken grade 11 chemistry or a different level of math in grade 12. And um, I did very well in that chemistry class because I was motivated. Exactly. You can do it. And the other thing I've realized is that in this day and age, public school and that whole approach is very stuck in the 19th, 20th century. Now, if you want to learn something, you can put in a search on YouTube and learn pretty much anything you want to learn or just go to the library. Like we are so past the days of, oh, unless you go into this specific place, you're never going to get this information. MIT has like all their classes online. Uh, If I can get an MIT, you know, the MIT knowledge for free through a Google search, why do I have to spend nine months trying to cram this information into my child who really could care less right now? Right. When all they have to do is when they decide they want to do it. If they decide they want to do it, if it's even relevant to what they want to do, yeah, they can learn it in a fraction of the time because they are, like you said, they're motivated. They want to, it makes sense. There's a reason for it. It's not someone coming and saying, you have to learn this just because, you know, yeah. treating them like we would treat ourselves. I don't sit myself down every day and make myself do three hours of work that makes no sense to my life. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, why would I do that? Exactly. So why would I force my child to do that? Like, why is you know, that what their childhood is supposed to be? It's interesting that you say that because I see my son, who's my fourth, and he's 13. He's the kid that is now practicing or working towards this grandmaster chess champion mm-hmm. thing. <laughs> Clearly, it's not my thing. But <laughs> He, um, he often engages me when we're playing games with, let me explain to you the rules for the next 15 minutes so that we can play this game. And I'm like, he's the only kid in this entire house that does not understand yet. This is not how mom works. <laughs> I think like this, she is not going to compete with literally anything game oriented with you. Yeah. We'll never do math offs with him. He's very intelligent. So I've got lots of kids that are very math oriented. This is not me. Mm-hmm. And so in reverse, my child is trying to teach me something that I'm like, please, I don't care. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I I'm- love you, but I don't care. <laughs> I do not love chess. He is so <laughs> like, mom, there are more ways to approach chess moves than there are stars in the galaxies. And I'm like, <laughs> cool. <laughs> let's go do have fun with that <laughs> exactly so what are the most popular questions that you hear from the homeschool curious or people that are like exploring the idea of homeschooling gosh probably one of the biggest is what if it doesn't work and I have to put them back in public school and that that is such a setup for failure it's a setup for self-fulfilling prophecy of your children going back to school because The minute you take this approach of, well, I'm going to homeschool, but I'm going to do it in line with what my kids would be learning in public school so that if I ever need to put them back, it'll be easy. Right. And I'm like, if you're going to do that, if you're going to take this approach of, well, they might like, there's no real reason for that. It's not like, well, you know, we're going to homeschool for a year and then we're moving and we know we're going to put them in or, you know, something like that. It's just this, it's this fear. It's a fear-based thing. I might screw it up. I might have to put them back. And so they want to be prepared and, you know, it's good to be prepared, but I'm like, the best way to prepare your kids is to help them become strong learners and forcing them to go along with this artificial system over here that you just took them out of is not going to help them. It's going to hinder everything you do. It's going to keep you um, shackled to this completely artificial system. It's going to be miserable. And then your kids aren't going to enjoy homeschooling. You're going to get burned out. And what's going to happen? You're going to say, oh, homeschooling wasn't for us. I guess I need to put them back. So I always tell them, look, is there a chance, you know, like horrible things in the world might happen 
And you might have to someday go do something you can't imagine ever having to do. Do you spend your whole life in preparation for that thing? Yeah. No, like you reasonably prepare yourself for likely things. We live in an area where we get hurricanes every year. So we have a stash of food just in case there's, you know, we can't get to the stores, the power's out and we're flooded or whatever. It's reasonable to do that. There's reasonable planning to take. But when it comes to this view of like, well, but we don't know and we have to be prepared for everything. No, you really don't. What you need to do is say, is is decide that will never be an option for us. And our family has made that decision. We have said from the beginning, we will live in a box under a bridge before we put our children in public school. Like the lengths that we would go to are endless. It's never going to be an option. And so because it's not an option, we are always looking for solutions to make homeschooling work. We're yeah. not just, you know, we're not doing this whole like, well, mm, I don't, eh, uh, 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 maybe, uh, maybe it's just not for us. Let's just put them back. Okay. So, so the question, you clearly would prefer to live into a, in a box under a bridge. So you've read, was it boxcar children? <laughs> <laughs> Also, um, you're very confident. You are certain of this. And there's two thoughts at two different points here that I thought, oh, you know, someone listening, someone that's newer in homeschooling might say, I'm not that confident. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I can go off the beaten path and focus on what my education focus is or my values are around that or who is my actual child and then form something out of that so to me that's doubt and how do you work past that doubt to get to the place where you'd rather live in a box under a bridge (laughs) good question I think the first I think the the biggest way you do that is by de-schooling yeah because I think so much of our fear comes from the assumption that education is supposed to look a certain way that it's going it has to include certain things it has to go in a certain direction. It has to take a certain amount of time. There are all these expectations and assumptions that we, uh, that we set up for ourselves. And then we have this fear of not being able to hit all of these benchmarks that, that we've set up. The more you de-school, the more you realize those benchmarks don't exist. They are completely a figment of your own imagination. And once you're able to get out from under that, and see other people who are doing it successfully as well. That I think is such a huge confidence boost because then you realize, oh, I, I don't have to know everything. I don't have to be a teacher. I tell people all the time, okay, I've got an education degree. It did not make me a good homeschooler. It made homeschooling more difficult. My husband, who does not have an education degree, fantastic teacher, wonderful instructor did phenomenal with our kids the first two years when he was the one in charge um way better than I did because he didn't have all of those assumptions and expectations and quite frankly the indoctrination that I had about what education was supposed to look like this box you know which when you can get sorry go ahead oh I was just gonna say when you get out from that box when you get out from all those assumptions it's this huge breath of fresh air and you realize I was assuming so many things about what education needed to look like. And it turns out none of that is there. That makes it, it it, it is such a confident boost to realize I don't have to live up to all that. That's not education. That's not what it's about. So I think the combination of those two things, getting into the sphere of successful homeschoolers, veterans who've been doing it for a long time, a tribe of community of some kind that where you can see people living this out who are further down the path than you and de-schooling yourself, really, really putting time, significant time and effort into de-schooling yourself. Most important things. So, you know what I hear too, and I've learned this in myself over the course of time, homeschooling, like not homeschooling alongside whatever the school system is suggesting. Cause some, you know, in our province, there is a way to do that where you can do something called online learning or. Oh yeah learning. And it means that you are doing a schooling thing at home, which would have its benefits compared to the school socialization concept. But when you are truly homeschooling, when it's you looking at your child saying, what do you need to become a grown up that's independent and has agency and, and able to become who you're meant to be, that kind of homeschooling takes a lot of chutzpah. And so we're talking about that de-schooling process, but going through 15 years of 
de-schooling and enabling that specific child, it actually really emboldens us mm -hmm. as humans. We, we become really certain that, listen, I don't know about podcasting, but I'm going to figure out podcasting or yeah. all the, all the background things that we, you and I have to figure out in order to contact or access human beings outside of our, our home or our town and online, you know, all the website things or all the SEO or all the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the stuff, the techie stuff, we had to figure that out. And there's a certain level of chutzpah or independence that's kind of like encouraged in us just because we can help our kids learn. We can do this stuff too. For yeah. Itself. yeah. I think realizing that we as adults are constantly learning what we want to learn about and doing it successfully right. kind of helps to open our eyes that, oh, like my kids can do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I, as an adult, am in a position where I can just say, I want to go to the library today and learn about this, or I want to go online and learn about this. And we just do it. Our kids don't necessarily have that ability because they can't just, you know, hop in the car. Or we don't let them just get on the internet, but we can facilitate that mm -hmm. and give them that opportunity to learn in a way that makes sense for them, just like we get to do. And right. when we stop seeing a child's education as being this very special, unique um, bubble thing and just realize it's just doing what we do all the time, you know, then it kind of demystifies it. I yeah. think parents feel like there's something special and magical that happens when you have just the right curriculum and just the right teacher and just the right, and they, they don't think they can replicate that or that they have access to that or that they can, you know, have that same kind of magic at home. And I'm like, it ain't magic. <laughs> it's really not. And, and this idea that it has to be a, done a certain way or it negates the whole thing. It, it's nonsense. Education has become so over complicated in the public school. It does not take all of that stuff that they're doing to teach anybody. They're making it so much more complicated than it needs to be. And even more expensive than we can. <laughs> make. Oh my word. Seriously. I'm like, you know, we talk about defunding public schools or like, you know, getting rid of property taxes and people are like, how are the schools going to survive? I'm like, ask any homeschool mom, how did this, how did your children learn when all you had was a library card and, you know, the internet, Hey, turns out they can actually learn quite a lot. You don't need thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars per child to educate. So the way to be confident is really to practice this de-schooling practice. Yes, absolutely. The more you the more you get rid of this idea that public school is a standard that we're supposed to be hitting, or it's the main way of learning, or it's the, the, the best way of learning and everything else is just kind of an also ran, you know, the more you get rid of that idea, the more you realize what they're doing is, it's just one of many ways. And it's not even the best way. Okay. So you bust, you're essentially busting a homeschool myth that we are trying to compare our homeschools to the public school. Do you have any other homeschool myths that we can bust? Because you've got oh, my word. You've got I have a whole ebook of them. <laughs> That's why I, brought it up. <laughs> I think one of the, one of the biggest ones, I don't even know if we want to go into it because it, it could derail the entire conversation <laughs> is the whole socialization thing, yeah. right? That whole, that's the other one. That's like, it's so ubiquitous and it's so, you know, I just want to say, okay, look at the world right now and how the vast majority of human beings act and behave, particularly online. And then realize that the vast majority of those people were, were socialized in the public school. How in the world is that any kind of a testimony to that system? Why do you want your child looking like this world? No, it's like the worst way to socialize a child. Keeping them home and socializing them with family and siblings and neighbors is a heck of a lot more normal and logical than putting them in with a whole bunch of kids their age and somehow expecting that to culminate in proper behavior. Okay, it, so that, it's it's that's the same, so ridiculous. Yeah, the same question you had about, like, I always ask this, what is an education anyways? Mm -hmm. But what is a socialization scenario anyways? And yes. I think oftentimes when people ask that, they're really asking what social opportunities do your children have? Mm -hmm. And I say, well, we do what you expect. We lock them in the basement so they can't <laughs> see other human beings. 
Oh, wait, no, that's not what I say. But, (laughs) you know, it's not social opportunity. It is how do you develop, uh, you know, enable another human being to interact with other human beings? Or what would you say? I I absolutely agree. You're right. It's people don't think very clearly about what socialization actually is. Socialization is being able to interact with people. Like that's really it. When we put them into a classroom with a whole bunch of other eight-year-olds or whatever age your child is, you're not teaching them to socialize with lots of different kinds of people. You're teaching them to socialize with eight-year-olds. And then they're all going to be nine-year-olds. And then they're all going to be 10-year-olds. There's never any diversity there. Right. When you homeschool, your children are naturally, if you have multiple children, they are naturally going to be socializing with different ages. They're socializing with you as an adult. So they're learning to interact with another adult. You're going out into different groups, different, um, you know, co-ops or field trip groups, or even just going to the park, going to the museum, going wherever and talking to other people. That's socialization, being able to interact appropriately with lots of different kinds of people. The public school system is completely artificial. It does not look like what the world looks like. Learning how to socialize in that system does not prepare you for going into a job where your boss might be 20 years older than you or 20 years younger than you. Working with other people who look different from you, who talk differently from you, who have a different background. it's, It's so much easier, I think, to provide children with true... Uh, opportunities to truly socialize as a homeschooler than it is in public school. Cause I get to pick who are we going to be around? Nice. I'm going to pick diverse people who don't look like us and who don't talk like us. And yes, there are going to be times when they do look like us and they do talk like us because I'm also going to prioritize our beliefs and our values and make sure that the people that my kids are spending the most time with share those things. Cause that's important to me. And I think that's that important. makes yes. sense. You know, you know we'll naturally. Not- there are idiosyncrasies too, and all of our imperfections too. It's called being humans. Yes. But I actually think that that emotional regulation, teaching our children emotional regulation or teaching them about their emotional world, that is most definitely not done with the same age mm-hmm. peers because right. they also don't have the skills to deal with their emotions and try to understand what are the thoughts behind their emotions or how could they engage the feeling that they're having right now. They, there's no like same age peer that's like, hey, let's let's you know take a deep breath with me I mean maybe there are some uh, you know very aware 16 year old <laughs> somewhere that wasn't me or, but and just say let's breathe together and hold my hands and how are you feeling and I don't know all yeah, the yeah well and a teacher's not going to take that time if your child's having a meltdown a meltdown she's going to send them to the you know principal's office she's not going to be able she's not going to stop everything and say hey kiddo what's going on what, right. what's, what's happening? Let's figure this out. She doesn't have time to do that. She's got 29 other kids. She's got to get through this math lesson. You know, that's just a disruption. We don't have that many kids. And there are days where I'm like, I don't want to do it either. <laughs> Principle. Uh, yeah. I'm looking for the same thing. I don't always want to either. It's not, it's not easy. It's not an easy process, but it's really not happening with same aged peers. Yes. A hundred percent. And that's just part of home. It's part of parenting teaching our children how to manage their emotions, how to handle stress, how to handle disappointment, how to handle, you know, mean kids at the park or, you know, and the neighbors or whatever. It's part of parenting. And that's really all homeschooling is, is just an extension of parenting. And so that's right. another thing too, when you can get out of that, that public school mindset, when you've de-schooled, your enough, de-schooled yourself enough to, to recognize that sometimes the best use of your time is putting all of the curriculum away and sitting down with this kid and saying, man, you're having a really hard time. Can I help you process this? Like that is a far more important lesson in that moment than, you know, the lesson on fractions and decimals that you were planning, you know, I would prefer algebra. (laughs) It isn't necessarily as easy. That is true. (laughs) There's no, there's no instructor's guide. For the parent when it comes to helping their children with emotional stability. No, it is, actually, I think it really has to do with how much are we able to do it for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And then we naturally extend it with our child. You have so many amazing resources, though, on your website. Um, you talk about how to start homeschooling, how to simplify homeschooling, the seven, seven pillars for simplifying homeschooling. You have, um, you know, you talked about busting the homeschool myths at ebook and just quickly for anybody listening, I want them to hear some of the things you address because I just love it. Uh, 
one, it's only for geniuses. Um, it's only for religious fundamentalists. Uh, you can't get into college if you homeschool. You miss out on all the fun milestones. You miss out on extracurriculars. Like that one is confounding to me. You, <laughs> have, to you, have, you have to be teachers. It's too expensive. It sure can be if you make it to be. Yeah, but exactly. I'd, I'd go crazy around my kids all day long. Homeschool kids are awkward and unsocialized. And I could never do that. I will tell you that one of those definitely did not feel like a myth for some period of my homeschool. And it was, I'm going to go crazy if I'm around my kids all day long. <laughs> I love those. You've got incredible resources on your website. I would like to hear about the resources that you offer, or if you want to share a little bit about what you have to offer with homeschool parents. Absolutely. So I kind of have two different paths. Uh, when you go to my website there, you'd see that on the one hand, I've got a whole load boatload of resources that are just about helping parents get started yeah. and it get started and lay a solid foundation. So how to homeschool, how to homeschool in the early years when you're, you know, the kind of the birth through age seven ish, how to yeah. homeschool and still work because for so many parents, you know, going down to a single income, or maybe they're already at a single income because they're a single mom or a single dad. How do they do this and still do that? How do you homeschool if you have a kid with special needs? These right. are all things that parents, you know, a lot of times they won't start homeschooling because they don't think it's possible. So I've got these, a ton of resources there, lots of free, um, what I call guides, kind of like a blog, but not really a blog, um, guides on all of these different things to help parents make that, that shift. And then my main focus really with the coaching that I do is helping families to simplify. And so once you've kind of gotten started and you really kind of got your feet under you and you kind of know what you're doing, I think our tendency is to make it more difficult than it needs to be. And so that's kind of the next phase then is for me to say, okay, now that you've, you've started, let me help you simplify. Let's strip this down. Let's get, get you de-schooled. Let's get you focused on what's really important. Let's maximize the time that you have with your kids, prioritize relationship, prioritize life learning, but with boundaries, because with so many families, they start hearing that and they think, oh, that's going to be unschooling and unschooling is too, it's too loosey goosey. I can't do that. And there are things I love about unschooling, but I do think kids need certain structure. And I do think as parents, we are obligated to sit our kids down and teach them certain things. Like you just got to know this stuff. You just do. But I think there's ways to go about it. That's going to make it a lot more fun than saying, sit down, we're going to learn this. So that's what simplified homeschooling is all about. I've got these seven different um, pillars or values that we build this framework on that help parents to be able to strip things down to the basics, but really fill their homeschooling experience with their kids with a lot of rich experience, rich opportunities, um, and just shift the focus just a little bit so that yes, you've got the academics covered. Yes. You're, you know, you're learning all the things, but yeah. you're doing it in a very life focused, family focused, relationship focused, value focused way. So it's a little more balanced and it's not so heavy on the academics. And then we just kind of shove into whatever space we have left things like, you know, recreation and faith and, and free time and hobbies and things like that. This has been a beautiful conversation and I hope oh. that it's embolden people to feel confident that it's not just these two homeschool moms that have been doing it for a while, but there's actually a process that you also can be confident, not filled with doubt, but confident. Is there any advice that you'd like to share with the homeschool families? Oh man, de-school. It is the most important thing. Absolutely. And I'm actually going to be coming out with a program later on this year that is a kind of a, a way that to turbo boost and laser focus your de-schooling experience to get you further down that path faster. So it's not taking, you know, five years, like it's taken, <laughs> you know, a lot of us or more, you can get through that time really fast and get to that place where it's easier to simplify, where it's easier to get that stress off of you and not get so burnt out so quickly. I love how you call it the de-school boot camp. <laughs> it's, it's hardcore. Well, it's hard. I it, hardcore. It makes you think. And I think that's the thing we don't know. You know, if someone says, go think about this. You're like, how, like, what do you mean? Go think about this. What does that mean? So this really guides you 
what to think through, how to go through that process to really root out that those false beliefs you have about education and start rebuilding your own beliefs about education in a way that's going to suit your family best. It's been such a pleasure to have you here. So thank you so much, Teresa. It's been great. I'm so glad that you are part of the Homeschool Mama self-care podcast community. I can't wait to get to know you more and your homeschooled kiddos. I encourage you to jump on to my website, www.capturingthecharmlife.com, because I'm here to walk alongside you from one homeschool mama to another to encourage you toward clarity, confidence, and vision in your homeschool. To build into this community, I have created a Patreon community. As a supporter, your contribution helps me access equipment, reach guests, and supports the time it takes to get into the creative work to build each of these episodes. Be a supporter and you receive access to my Patreon-only feed, access to extended guest interviews, discounts on group mentoring intensives and masterminds, all the archived Patreon episodes and content, a community of like-minded homeschool moms. You can also access monthly support chats and ask me anything days. I'm really looking forward to building into this community, building into you and getting to know you. If you're interested in joining the Homeschool Mama self-care Patreon community, you can check me out on patreon.com homeschool mama self-care. I'll see you there.